So, um, you know, fascinating uh, piece about not just, you know, Jamal Khashoggi and the terrible assassination that Saudi conducted against him, but, you know, really an in-depth look at Saudi Arabia and the U.S. relationship. How, how did this project get started? Did you um, encounter any challenges during the project and what sort of safety precautions did you take? Well, um, I mean, both Larry and I have different kinds of ways into this. I mean, Larry's begins far before mine. I mean, he knew Jamal, uh, you know, for years before all this went down. But for me, the story first started, uh, you know, it was kind of like a, like a murder mystery. I mean, Jamal was, he was one of our own. He was a journalist who was murdered by the people who he, you know, criticized in print. And so, you know, in a way, I feel like as a journalist, we, it falls upon us to try to rescue what we can of the stories of our colleagues when they're murdered in this way. I mean, that, you know, sounds like a self-aggrandizing kind of act of selflessness, but actually I, I feel like in a way it's sort of a selfish act because we all of us, you know, we take risks uh, doing the kind of work we do uh, and we tell ourselves that those risks are worth it. We tell our families that those risks are worth it, that the stories we're telling matter and that uh, they matter more than the danger. Um, and so when someone is cut down like this, um, it, uh, you know, you want to, you want to believe that, that the pen is in some way mightier than the sword and that the risks that journalists take every day uh, re can redeem themselves in the face of, in the face of all this. So that was, you know, the main kind of moral thing that drew me into this. And in the beginning, you know, I, I thought of it as an investigation of a murder. And so we did the kinds of things you do in that sort of investigation. We talked to multiple national intelligence agencies. We reviewed some classified insight. We tracked down insiders who hadn't spoken before. And we uncovered you know, a few new things about, um, about the way that he was killed. But really, the deeper we got, the clearer it became that there was a much more fascinating story here, which wasn't, did Mohammed bin Salman order this murder, which you know we know with great certainty he did, um, not just, how this murder was undertaken. We know that too in, in excruciating detail, but why would the Saudi regime risk so much to silence this journalist? And who was this man uh, who, who was worth that, that kind of fight? Yeah, I mean, I think that added a lot to the story because I don't think people really understood Jamal's positioning in that whole broader dynamic. And it's interesting that you say uh, you know, self aggrandizing I think that one of the things we found at the Committee to Protect Journalists, given that the vast majority of journalists who are murdered are never brought to their masterminds and murderers are never brought to justice, is it, it often comes to documentary filmmakers and other journalists to do the investigations and bring some form of justice, which may simply be through telling the stories and continuing and delving into those stories to find out what really happened. You know, we've seen that with uh, Forbidden Stories, which has continued the reporting of Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta, uh, looked into the murder of journalists in Mexico. So I think you should give yourself more credit because this was a really important investigation into the dynamics of one of the most critical um, murders of a journalist in recent history with profound impacts um, around the world. What about you, Lawrence? When did, did you discover anything new during research or filming? I mean, you've known Jamal for years. You're an expert in the region, worked throughout the Middle East. Did you learn anything new in this process? Well, you know, first of all, I wanted to add to what Rick said so eloquently, but one of the things, if one of the reasons we did this and the reasons I think that the CPJ exists is that you can kill the journalist, but you can't kill the story, you know, and so it's important for journalists to pick up the banner and, and, and make sure that, that we're not silenced by that kind of ruthless intimidation that we saw with Jamal. Yeah, Jamal was a great friend and great guy. Wonderful, I think he's lost in this, he's become a symbol, but he was a warm and uh, amusing uh, friend. And I, you know, you, you would have enjoyed being with him, but, um, you know, I, I, I think I learned more about his romantic life than I, than I knew. Uh, when I last saw him, uh, he came to Austin where I live. And um, he had called me, uh, this was like six months before he was murdered. 
uh, and he had called me about a year before saying that he had to uh, leave Saudi Arabia. He, he, I knew his life had been under threat for me, even when I was living in Saudi Arabia in 2003, uh, you know, he was getting death threats. So it wasn't anything new, but so, this it was a totally new tone. And this time he had to leave everything. He left his family, he left his, you know, he was no longer allowed to write. So it's not, his career was taken away from him, but he was uprooted and, and he was lonely. Um, and, uh, you know, he, you know, to see all this, you know, the, the film really captures, I think, a lot of what we talk a lot about is murder and so on, but his experience of exile, uh, I think, was painful to him in many ways. And, you know, one of the things that we're piecing together is, you know, the last months of his life, what was driving him? Uh, he was trying to assemble the shards of the Arab Spring and bring that spirit back. You know, he was stand, he was pushing democracy. Also, rarely mentioned one of his themes was, you know, how the the Islamic world has just been drowned in inner rival wars. Uh, you know, and the wars are are retarding the progress in that section of the world so much. So those things he was really pushing, and I think. You know, a lot of what Rick and his team did that is so admirable is reconstructing that and putting together the last days of a really noble individual. Yeah, I mean, and also his, um, you know, his criticism of the Saudi regime and Mohammed bin Salman during bin Salman's, you know, giant victory lap of the world. And, you know, all you show those great clips of him meeting with all of those, you know, Silicon Valley and media and business figures. And I, I remember, you know, we, we at the Committee to Protect Journalists were kind of watching the fetting of this authoritarian dictator who had just, you know, recently imprisoned um, a bunch of dissidents, journalists, and including the Prime Minister of Lebanon, and wondering, you know, what is going on? How is everyone turning a blind eye to the vast human rights abuses and crackdown on the press in Saudi Arabia and what they're doing in Yemen, which resulted in the killings of, of dozens of journalists there and, and massive implications, obviously also far beyond journalists, but, you know, that's where our kind of link in this is. You know, I guess it'd be really interesting, Richard, you know, how did you um, go about filming in these very challenging conditions? Um, you know, you went to Turkey, um, you got some really interesting interviews. Um, how was it filming outside of the US? How was it filming in Turkey where, you know, it has a very checkered press freedom record. And it was funny because Tawakal said, um, you know, yeah. that there are a lot of dissidents who go there and yet, you know, we've seen Turkey eviscerate the independent press and we're, we're actually putting out our annual list of imprisoned journalists and Turkey is the second leading jailer of journalists. So it was an interesting and I would imagine challenging place to try to film. Definitely, yeah. I mean, it riddled with contradictions, right? I mean, Turkey on the one hand has provided refuge for, um, uh, you know, whatever, refugees of the Arab Spring have, uh, have ended up there from Syria, um, from uh, Egypt, from everywhere, from Saudi as well. Um, but at the same time, I, I think, you know, it imprisons more journalists than any other country except for China, right? Um, uh, it's, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I read your reports, you know, religiously, but it's uh, it's an appalling record, yeah. I mean, um, one of the things, I mean, Jamal's story is epic, right? It like spans decades, spans continents. Um, he's, you know, finds himself at the center of this hurricane, like his entire life, not just, you know, a journalistic observer, but in, sometimes an active participant in these world historical events that like shape our time and continue to shape our time. And so to really tell a story, we had to retrace his steps. And that meant going to Afghanistan, um, you know, going to Saudi Arabia itself, which was by far the most complicated and difficult shoot. Uh, we How were did that work? Tell what? us more about that. How did you gain access to Saudi Arabia were you concerned about your security? Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, we were in uh, we were in conversation for a long time with the Saudi embassy trying to secure journalist visas. Um, you know, and they you know promised this new spirit of openness and kept whatever. It seemed like they might do it, but anyway, they, we were denied visas. So 
Um, so I got a, a tourist visa and I went with, um, with you know, small format cameras and filmed kind of under the radar. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that was so challenging about telling the story is that, you know, many of the people who knew Jamal very well um, were terrified to speak to us. You know, any, most of the people we talked to in Saudi just wouldn't talk at all. Some of them would talk, but, you know, demanded insane, you know, deep background, insane security protocols. Um, so we, uh, we had to, it took us a year to find people who were really close to him, who were able, comfortable, willing to come out and speak. And it wasn't just the fear of physical safety. I mean, a lot of his, you know, he was a, he was a kind of star in the world of journalism. A lot of his friends and the people who knew him best were journalists in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And as, as you know, there are, there are, uh, you know, there are a few satellite outlets in Qatar that are not owned by the Saudi royal family, but all of the rest are owned partially or in whole by the Saudi royal family. Same thing with the print media. It, I mean, what print publications are there that don't have, that aren't partially owned by a print? So if you want to have a career in journalism in the Middle East, you can't afford to, um, to say anything that's critical of the regime. I mean, I would, I'm curious, I would love to ask you, Courtney. Um, I mean, I've, I spent like 10 years as a, as a war reporter covering Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, other, you know, lesser known battlegrounds of the global war on terror. And in every single one of these conflicts, Saudi was an active participant. Every combatant on the ground would like, would readily admit it, would, you know, it was, a, it was just a known fact. But in the press, in the global press, it was almost never spoken of. I mean, what, what do you think accounts for that kind of amazing control of the narrative that Saudi execute or exercises? Well, I mean, I think you put your finger on one aspect of it, which is it's, you know, vast control and influence over much of the media in the Middle East. Um, you know, Al Jazeera gets criticized a lot for its lack of criticism about um, Qatar. But the fact is, it's one of the few independent outlets in the region that can compete on the same level. And for all of its, you know, challenges, it is, you know, one of the only alternatives to a Saudi dominated media environment. Similarly, you know, as you document in the film, Saudi Arabia has extensive business interests around the world and it has a lot of money and a lot of oil, a lot of influence. I mean, I'm based here in Washington, D.C., along with the, you know, firms that it hires here, the PR and lobbying firms. I, I don't even know how many it has now on retainer to lobby for its interests, to influence policymakers, et cetera. And, you know, we saw this in President Trump's uh, comments in the wake of Jamal's murder about weighing very publicly uh, the value of Saudi Arabia's economic and security relationship versus the value of Jamal Khashoggi and any sort of pretense to defend press freedom. And we saw you know, where, where uh, he came out on that equation. So I think it's not surprising. You know, I had a, a meeting with a, a Western government who was starting a big media freedom coalition and saying, you know, Saudi Arabia needs to be at the top of the list of countries to deal with, not only because of the extremely repressive conditions inside the country, imprisonment of journalists, but also its war in Yemen and its extraterritorial assassination of Jamal Khashoggi and the, the, the fear that creates among journalists. And I, I'm gonna wanna ask Lawrence about this, you know, but I think all of those you know, factors combine to create an environment in which, you know, there are very few entities that are out there speaking out about Saudi Arabia, you know, the Committee to Protect Journalists and some of the human rights organizations are trying to do that. But look at the hosting of the G20 summit, you know, going ahead as if everything is normal. Mm -hmm. um, but if I can, I want to, you know, hear from Lawrence about, you know, I feel this dynamic as a press freedom advocate and uh, a journalist, also having worked for a Saudi outlet, you know, a real chilling effect about their extraterritorial reach, their ability to assassinate a journalist that was theoretically kind of under the protection somehow of the United States, a citizen working for an outlet here, and no meaningful, never held accountable. What, do, what signal does this send to you as a journalist? What do you think that other journalists and the media industry are, are feeling from this? I mean, there's no question that the level of threat is you know, far higher and it used to be the case that if you were American 
you had a certain sense of not invulnerability, but you were, your life was more protected. Your government had your back. I don't think any journalist feels that way now. Uh, it wasn't just because of Jamal, but that was such a strong, uh, I mean, naked uh, display of indifference uh, to the, you know, the, and this was a guy, he was, a, you know, not an American citizen, but he was an American resident working for the Washington Post. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's staggering to think that, uh, you know, the, the government of the United States would withdraw all sense of protection. Uh, and you know, it's a great loss for journalism, but it's a great loss for America too. You know, that, that we've, for decades, we've seen the news industry under attack financially and so on, the withdrawal of foreign bureaus and so on. It, it, our, our ability to understand the rest of the world is greatly diminished by the retreat of the press from the rest of the world. And now uh, it becomes obvious that uh, there's a, there's a, price uh, to be paid for journalists uh, to go into other countries and they're you know outlets are afraid to send their their reporters uh, into some many countries uh, and a large part of that is because the government isn't going to be there for them why do you think that I mean what was the calculation or the consideration that Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman had where they determined apparently that they could assassinate a journalist in Turkey, again, with that US connection, with impunity, in the midst of this kind of, you know, global charm offensive um, reform efforts, like what was it at root that enabled them to make that decision? And do you think that they, that they were proven right in that calculation? I mean, uh, that is a that is a very important, complicated, and difficult question. I mean, I think uh, certainly there was a an atmosphere of impunity that we had provided, we the United States had provided for Mohammed bin Salman up to this point. I mean, he was able he kidnapped the prime minister of Lebanon. Um, uh, he like was bombing. Yemen committing some of the worst, well, the worst human rights abuses on the planet at the time. Um, he'd murdered in Yemen thousands, tens of thousands of innocent civilians, um, and uh, and there hadn't been a there hadn't been a word. He'd uh, imprisoned um, the you know women who uh, driving activists, Lujain Hathloul, um, uh, and they were being tortured inside. I mean, uh, and uh, he'd uh, already had this. Uh, um, uh, diplomatic showdown with Canada over the most benign kind of rebuke around human rights abuses and he'd come out unscathed. So I think we had created uh, an environment of impunity, an atmosphere of impunity, an, an understanding that he could get away with anything. And because of his special relationship with Trump, that was only kind of amplified. Um, you know, I mean, I think, so So I think, you know, he believed he could get away with every, anything. And it, it seems like, it seems like he might be right about that. I mean, on top of that, Jamal, um, Jamal was no ordinary journalist too. Um, and that's one of the, one of the you know, things that the film kind of goes into. He was, um, his story is, is amazing to, to, I mean, and moving to me because to me it's kind of, it's a redemption story on top of all of the tragedy and horror of it all because this is a man who, um, who time and again saw his heroes, heroes who he helped create in the press. I mean, he wrote the first pieces about bin Laden, lionized him and helped champion him in the press. Um, he, the, you know, he saw these heroes turn into villains before his own eyes um, and felt himself to be, have somehow become complicit in these massive global crimes. Like after September 11th, it shook him. And, he, and to his great credit, you know, even with all the power and prestige he had being so close to the centers of power, he was wounded by these moments and changed by them. You know, again, he went, after September 11th, he went and served um, with a former head of Saudi intelligence and became a spokesman for the regime, um, you know, through the Iraq war and afterwards. And then when he saw Saudi Arabia lead and finance the counter-revolution that murdered the hope of the Arab Spring in the street, um, that shook him again. And as Larry says in the film, I mean, he, um, the contradictions became too stark and he had to choose what side he was on. And, you know, 59 years old, 
his entire life, his career, his family, everything locked into the circles of power in Saudi Arabia, he could not morally countenance being on the side of this atrocity. And he took a stand. And for that, the princes who he'd served his entire life murdered him. And I mean, Lawrence, what do you think as, you know, a journalist, you know, there, I think in the U United States, we tend to have this kind of, you know, uh, puritanical approach to journalism where, you know, we're often journalists don't vote. They have to, you know, be completely, uh, you know, objective. Although I think many journalists are realizing that that is no longer a model that works. Um, but, you know, what was it that Jamal wrote that was so threatening in papers? Why, you know, why did Saudi Arabia reach out and assassinate him? What what was it about him that was so threatening? Well, Courtney, I'm sure you remember from your time in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, I've never been to Saudi, only to Dubai. Oh, but <laughs> okay. right. well, in Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, there's a prohibition on the human form. You know, they you know you don't have pictures of uh, uh, you know you know portraits and stuff like that. There, even when I was there, there was an argument over whether the Starbucks uh, logo was allowed. Uh, it was finally decided it was a mythological figure, so not human. There are, part, there are billboards of the royal family everywhere. They're the only human apparitions that you actually see. And they're the only people who have a voice. And this is what distinguished Jamal. Uh, most of Saudi journalists, I mean, when I was there, I was old. Don't write about the royal family. Don't write about religion, and don't write about government. Well, it doesn't leave much on your plate, right? So, and don't worry about women. Yeah, it was a. It's a very constrained uh, circumstance. Jamal was. Uh, it's not that he didn't pay attention to those details, but he stretched the limit, and moreover, he found an outlet in talking to people like me that he could get the word out about what was going on. Uh, and he, you know, he developed a, a, a constituency, uh, not just among other journalists, outsiders, but you know, inside Saudi Arabia, he was a person who crossed boundaries. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he knew bin Laden well, but he was also very closely with a lot of the royal family. Yeah, he had gotten some education in the United States, so he understood the West. And yet he had you know, been in the Muslim Brothers. He was a person who, who Across so many different boundaries, and was able to communicate with people on all sides, and that's really unusual. And the other thing that was very striking to me, uh, you know, tyrannies create cowards. Uh, you know, people are afraid to speak out, and for good reason. Jamal was not. Uh, he was he was humorous. You know, even when he was saying things that were rather dangerous. Uh, I remember when uh, when he got the job as the head of Okaz. I mean, uh, was it Okaz? It was a, a it was another newspaper in southern um, Saudi Arabia, and um, he published a cartoon about a suicide bomber. But the suicide bomber was a, a was a cleric, and instead of dynamite in his vest, there were fatwas. I can't tell you how daring that he was only lasted in the job for six weeks. Uh, and then they hired him again. And I think he lasted 13 days. He was always pushing and he always had a voice. And so he was always a volatile element in a culture that likes for everything to be stable and nailed down. And then when they finally got rid of him and he came to America, what happened? He went to Washington DC, the capital of the most powerful country in the world and Saudi Arabia's biggest ally. And he started writing for the Washington Post, which is the house paper of the Washington establishment. His voice just got so big. And that's, I think, fundamentally what uh, the, the royal family, was, especially one individual, couldn't stand. And that's why he had to be eliminated. And I think you hit on a couple of really important points also, you know, these red lines, they shifted after the Arab Spring, right? In 
my my experience, I, I did my doctoral research there and wrote a book about Egypt and, and cyber activism and citizen journalism. And, you know, what I saw from working in, in Lebanon as a journalist and, and Egypt is, you know, we know, and, and Dubai, of course, um, you know, we, we kind of knew where the red lines were. So, you know, when I started at at Al Arabiya in Dubai, they, you know, we discussed where the red lines are. And I agreed to that because I wanted the experience of working in that newsroom, but like always pushing. And after the Arab Spring, I think, you know, those of us who pushed found that we were fired, kicked out of the country, um, imprisoned. I mean, Egypt had almost no journalists in prison before the Arab Spring. Now it is the world's third leading jailer of journalists year after year, you know, those red lines are less clear. Um, and I think, you know, the Arab Spring in the, in the film, uh, you talk about how that was a turning point for Jamal, but it was also, I think, a turning point for the conditions under which journalists in the region work under and a realization by a lot of governments there that um, they need to reinforce those red lines technology, they need to get out ahead of that. And no, you know, when I, when I was living in Egypt, um, they kind of like let journalists working in English or working online have a bit more freedom. Um, after the Arab Spring it was like, no, we've got to clamp down on online expression, maybe even worse than, than um, you know, if it's taking place in, in broadcast or in print. So it really shifted, you know, the dynamics after the Arab Spring. And, and we heard that from Jamal as well. Talk to me a little bit more about, you know, how Jamal saw the Arab Spring and Saudi Arabia's role in, you know, as you said, eviscerating the dream of the Arab Spring. Yeah, I mean, Larry can, Larry can of course take this too. I mean, you knew him well during this period of time, but just in, you know, we, part of our process in um, making this film was to go back and collect all of the written, you know, works that Jamal had ever done, plus, you know, um, personal correspondence with uh, as many people as we could down to text messages and WhatsApp messages and, you know, reconstruct his kind of personal arc through all of this. And so um, the Arab Spring was, in, in all of these levels, um, was, uh, was just earth shaking for him. I mean, as it was for the whole region, but in his more private interactions with people, um, you know, he talked about it as, uh, you know, he thought after September 11th, he thought that the Arab world was locked in a struggle between Al Qaeda and Islamic extremism and despotic monarchies that were the only force opposed to them. And he had, you know, I think still felt guilt for his, for having been a part of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan or whatever role he may have, you know, inadvertently played in the creation of this monster and threw his lot in with the monarchies to, as a counterbalance. After the Arab Spring, you know, he, you know, his friends tell us he felt like there was a, there was an escape from this prison, right? There was another option. And that option was, uh, was for the Arab world to remake itself from the inside democratically without not, you know, not a future that's imposed by like an American invasion of Iraq or, or, or any outside power, um, not the victory of either, you know, the kings or the despots who will then decide how they're going to, you know, perform, but the people actually taking control of their own destiny, the Arab world, world rebirthing itself from the inside. Um, and then to see that, uh, you know, and then he, he writes, you know, movingly later in his life about how this, you know, the kind of explosion of love that he felt in the, in the street and, you know, how everything kind of changes. Um, but then to see that just a few years later, see the, the, you know, the princes he served his whole life, you know, responsible for liquidating that movement um, was, uh, was beyond heartbreaking to him. It was to keep working for them became a betrayal of, of everything that he had hoped to be a part of. And, um, uh, and so, the, you know, that was what kind of pushed him, pushed him over the brink. Lawrence, you want to add anything to that? Well, just that he was, he was pulling those strings back together. I mean, what happened with the people that were the leaders of the Arab Spring, they became this terrific diaspora in the West, a lot in the U.S. and U.K. and Turkey, I guess. And uh, Jamal began, you know, he became an ambassador to that uh, diaspora. And uh, 
I don't think that Jamal thought that the Arab Spring was dead. Uh, I think it, he just felt that it was demoralized and uh, it needed to be recruited again. I, the problem that the Arab Spring had was it wanted to get rid of the, the tyrant, but it didn't have an agenda, it didn't have a leader. And you know, Jamal, I think, was going to try to bring it. I don't think he intended to lead it, but he intended to reassemble the pieces. And that was a terrible threat, uh, not just to Saudi Arabia, but to tyrants all over the region. That's that's interesting you say that. I I mean, I agree that there was, I don't think that I don't think it was that they didn't have an agenda, but like think about where the Arab Spring was springing up. It was in countries where there was no capacity for civil society to build up the institutions that need to take place once you get the tyrant or the despot out of power. So I think it was also unrealistic of the international community writ large to expect that the people who could bring around the change also had the ability to institutionalize it. Because think about it, in these countries, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Syria, there, um, Libya, you know, there was no real civil society ready to take over and create institutional politics, um, with the exception, for example, in Egypt, where you had the Muslim Brotherhood, which was really the only organized alternative. So, you know, I don't know, I just, I, I feel like it's a little bit unfair to say that the reformers didn't have an agenda. <clears throat> they had an agenda, but I think they didn't have the capacity to bring about that agenda on their own. I agree, Courtney. I, 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 I'm guilty of, uh, at, I thought Egypt was ready for democracy. And uh, I, you know, I was there uh, just before Arab Spring and after. Um, and, you know, as a country I really adore. I had, you know, lived two years of my life there. And, uh, I, I thought I knew, you know, that this country had, a, had an ancient experience with democracy. Uh, even when it was ruled by kings, you know, there was a Congress and it, you know the king was essentially uh, irrelevant to the you know running of the country. So I thought you know Egypt was ready. I was totally wrong. And uh, it, you're right to observe that there were you know these two institutions. There was the army and the Muslim Brothers, and uh, the Muslim Brothers you know seized power, but the army you know took it back. Uh, but the 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 middle course that the Arab Spring was longing for, the voice of the people, simply wasn't ready. And um, the other thing in, in, in Saudi Arabia, you know, where I, I forecast trouble down the road because, you know, with the price of oil being far below what is, sustain, what is sustainable for that country and not likely to spring back anytime soon, uh, there's gonna be a lot of questioning about what the future of the royal family is, but revolution in that part of the world has never turned out very well. You know, if you're a Saudi and you're looking at Libya and, and Iraq and Iran and, and you know, uh, Sudan, uh, you know, those movements have always hit a brick wall. And, you know, there, there was an effort in the US during the Bush administration to create a kind of democracy core that would but by that time, we had invaded Iraq and become discredited, and nobody wanted to hear what we had to say. Well, and also remember that when Hamas came to power in 2006 through democratic elections, the um, Bush administration kind of drew back right. support for democracy promotion because it saw what happened um, when you gave people the vote. But I think um, with respect to the Arab Spring, we're coming up on a, the decade anniversary, 10 years on, since the since the Arab Spring happened, um, and you know, I look at the situation now, and many of the of my friends and the people I wrote about, and the journalists that you know I followed, um, are in jail or they are in exile, um, and it is a very different environment as well technologically. You know, one of the things that stood out about you know, why these primarily you know, young people and, um, you know, free expression advocates of, of all stripes were able to bring about this change is because they could imagine a different future. Part of that because they had these new forms of expression online that were unfettered and, you know, were given more freedom. That is completely different now. 
right? Now, not only is it highly restricted and surveilled, you also have a massive spyware apparatus and surveillance apparatus that has, um, you know, really shifted the balance of power between individuals, reformers, journalists, anyone with a, you know, different imagine, imagination about the future and those who are in power. I mean, one of the things that we know about Jamal and his network and now about other journalists who have been murdered is that they have been surveilled with very sophisticated spyware by the governments that they report on. So it's how do you, you know, just to bring it also back to the film, I mean, A, how do you deal with this very different uh, environment a, a decade on from Arab Spring? What are we thinking is gonna happen? And how did you even go about getting in touch with people in Saudi Arabia and in Turkey knowing very well the serious digital security threats um, posed by this sophisticated, you know, the NSO group, the Pegasus, all this, you know, very sophisticated spyware that has made secure communications virtually impossible. Yeah, it, uh, it was definitely incredibly difficult. I mean, I'll, you know, just to, one of the things that I hear you saying, and, you know, it seems like it's present in your work, Courtney, is the, uh, is the idea that, the, that the, the authoritarians and the despots of the region have learned exactly the wrong lessons from the Arab Spring. Not that uh, they need to create a safety valve of freedom to allow their population, you know, but instead that they need complete and total narrative control where they turn, it's not just spyware uh, in, in social media, it's turning, you know, Twitter and social media into weapons of controlling uh, you know, mass perception, like, you know, half of the Twitter accounts in Saudi Arabia are government run bots that just spew propaganda all the time and attack anyone who, uh, um, who speaks contrary. I mean, that's... Wasn't that one of Jamal's projects? I mean, he was working on this kind of counter narrative um, information campaign that would be a counter to the disinformation and online harassment campaigns by Saudi Arabia. Is that one of the reasons that he was targeted? Well, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, Dawn was his, uh, was his main kind of project, which was sort of a uh, half think tank, half kind of activist group trying to incubate, um, you know, narratives around democracy in, in the Arab world. A democracy for the Arab world now uh, was that group. Um, the, um, uh, you know, and I think, I think as, as important as the digital side of things are, uh, right? And as much as, and also as, uh, as kind of attractive as they are as stories to us, um, you know, in our kind of world. I mean, I think that his his primary his pri the primary threats that he posed was a was a more traditional one. I mean, it was it was writing from the op ed page of the Washington Post, right? Like that was the platform that made him dangerous. And in the end, they they did you know they used Pegasus. They used these this spyware that was developed by Western arms contractors and sold to uh, and sold to Saudi Arabia. They used that to get inside his phone and the phones of activists around him. But in the end, um, they, you know, he walked into the embassy, right? <laughs> they, they like lured him into the embassy for papers that he, you know, telling him he needed to, to get papers for marriage. I mean, it was, um, uh, it was, it ended up being, you know, much more kind of mundane and, and physical and tactile kind of tools that were used to kill him and, and the kind of threat he posed. So, you know, as crucial as those things are, um, I mean, I think that the, uh, that the deeper interests that were were at play were, you know, touched by those larger kind of those larger institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. And frankly, one of the things that we're constantly trying to do at the Committee to Protect Journalists is to, you know, get away from this idea that there's like the virtual world and then the real world. Like these are the world, and especially in the era of journalists being exiled and you know our global communication sphere is these are interrelated and you know what we call online harassment and digital threats have very physical instantiations and you know the, the interplay between that um lawrence you know what about you what do you think is jamal hashokshi's legacy um as a journalist and you know as someone who literally ended up giving his life to um to do journalism i think his legacy is in the balance, Courtney. I, you know, we know what he stood for. Um, 
And I'm sure that there are a lot of young, uh, especially Arab journalists who look at him uh, as both as a model and as a caution. And that's, uh, you know, if, if, if the Arab world can achieve uh, some modicum of press freedom, uh, then I think that it will be in part because of Jamal's uh, life and his example. But, uh, you know, I think what the goal of the rulers of Saudi Arabia is not only to kill the man, but to kill his example. And uh, so I'm not sure, you know, the answer is, I hope that he leaves the legacy that we, we honor him for in this film. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've done what we can to shine a light on it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's possible that the new administration will have something to say about this. But, you know, the United States is not gonna knock off Mohammed bin Salman, you know. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be up to his cousins to decide that maybe this was too high a price to pay and they want to remove him from power. Uh, but that's, again, it's hard to say if that's actually going to happen. Yeah, you know, one of our big focal points for the new administration is going to be getting justice for Jamal. Um, are we holding our breaths? No, but it is vitally important that the Biden administration um, turn over documents that have been required, fulfill its legal obligations, which the Trump administration did not pursue. And we actually have a lawsuit in, um, that is seeking more information. So, you know, we're hoping to help ensure that his legacy uh, is one that leads to greater openness and accountability. But, you know, I think that we as, you know, free expression advocates, as journalists, we can't do that all on our own. We yeah. need the support of the United States government um, and other governments who ultimately care about the um, future of press freedom, of journalism, and the fundamental role that that plays in not just reform efforts, but in the continuation of, of democracy as well. Um, one thing I want to grab, and hopefully we can um, edit out my this part, but you know, we, we did this book of, this is, this is a book called The Last Column. And in here we collected um, the last columns of several journalists who were murdered um, for their work and, and killed in the line of duty. And Jamal's um, last column is entitled, What the Arab World Needs Most is Free Expression. And um, I just feel like as we're talking here and we're talking about his legacy, I think the symbolic nature of that last column that he wrote and the importance of that and the, the issues that you bring to light through this film um, should compel all of us to really think about how what we can do in our own way to bring justice even if it's just through the public attention and the refusal to normalize, um, you know, how Saudi Arabia is treated as, as a, a country on the international stage, you know, we'd like to see Saudi Arabia not be included in, you know, these diplomatic initiatives that somehow indicate that it is normal to assassinate journalists, to throw them behind bars, to completely eviscerate any sort of domestic reform movement. So, Anyways, it's just really powerful that his last column that he wrote was about free expression um, in the Arab world. And, and he was literally murdered because of that. Well, Courtney, I wanna thank you and CPJ for all you're doing to bring attention to this. It, it's very, it's good to have somebody have our backs. And so it's, we, we really appreciate your efforts. Well, thanks for that. And we appreciate um, that journalists are increasingly realizing that they can use the tools at their disposal and documentarian filmmakers as well um, to investigate these murders and, and delve into um, you know, what actually happened. So thank you for the work you do and uh, congratulations on a really amazing and insightful film. Thank you very much.